This is uh, built similar to the inn. All right, here's where I'm at. So we came up this road right here. Stevens Canyon, there's Box Canyon, and here's Paradise. This is Nasquilly Glacier, Watts Glacier. The road goes back down the Nisqually River, out to the Nisqually entrance to Ashford. Got a balcony with a view that you can't see today. It's a nice building. And a dining. All right, this is the Meadows area that you hike up to. You can't really see it today. It's a uh, kind of like the end. It had a laminated cedar, it looks like. Probably Western Cedar. Debris flow hazard zone. Just a few generations ago, newcomers began arriving, bringing new technologies and new ways of living. Many came to log, mine, and farm. Others were drawn to the mountain itself. Many looked at wilderness as something to be conquered or tamed. In 1870, Hazard Stevens and P.B. Van Trump became the first of the new settlers to summit the mountain, passing close to where we are now. They were awed by what they found. Immediately about the mountain, on every side, deep gorges falling off precipitously, thousands of feet. A great field of ice and snow which covered the crown of the mountain overhung these gorges and was continually breaking off in immense masses, which fell with the roar of thunder. The whole scene was sublimely awful. Just 14 years later, the Longmire family founded the tourism trade at Mount Rainier by erecting the first buildings at the mineral springs on the southwestern slope of the mountain. The business took hold. Paradise was about to undergo a dramatic transformation. In 1899, at the dawn of a new century, Congress created Mount Rainier National Park, the country's fifth national park. Visitors began to flock to Mount Rainier, especially Paradise. Automobiles made the mountain a relatively easy destination for the adventurous. The biggest challenge many faced was the park's poor roads. Mount Rainier's isolation became one of its chief draws, and in boom times, the number of visitors. Yellow is a Lahar hazard zone. Ashford, Puyallup River, way down to Tacoma.
Just a few generations ago, newcomers began arriving, bringing new technologies and new ways of living. Many came to log, mine, and farm. Others were drawn to the mountain itself. Many looked at wilderness as something to be conquered or tamed. In 1870, Hazard Stevens and P.B. Van Trump became the first of the new settlers to summit the mountain, passing close to where we are now. They were awed by what they found. Immediately about the mountain, on every side, deep gorges falling off precipitously, thousands of feet. The great field of ice and snow which covered the crown of the mountain overhung these gorges and was continually breaking off in immense masses, which fell with the roar of thunder. The whole scene was sublimely awful. Just 14 years later, the Longmire family founded the tourism trade at Mount Rainier by erecting the first buildings at the mineral springs on the southwestern slope of the mountain. The business took hold. Paradise was about to undergo a dramatic transformation. In 1899, at the dawn of a new century, Congress created Mount Rainier National Park, the country's fifth national park. Visitors began to flock to Mount Rainier, especially Paradise. Automobiles made the mountain a relatively easy destination for the adventurous. The biggest challenge many faced was the park's poor roads. Mount Rainier's isolation became one of its chief draws, and in boom times, the number of visitors the biggest challenge many faced was the park's poor roads. Mount Rainier's isolation became one of its chief draws, and in boom times, the number of visitors swelled. During the first part of the 20th century, the park was becoming a playground of sorts. During the Depression, the Civilian Conservation Corps helped to improve roads, trails, and campgrounds. World War II brought a sudden change to the park. Tourism plummeted, but the mountain was ideal for another use. It became a training ground for the 10th Mountain Division. Up on Mount Rainier, paradise is humming with activity as skier soldiers practice a unique style of combat. After months of rigorous training, they're ready to take on the enemy. Good luck, boys. Peacetime brought renewed tourism. Visitors had been driving to the park for you years, actually, yeah. and now improved roads and more reliable vehicles led to a boom in car tourism. It all seemed new and exciting. Skiing was taking off as a sport, and visitors jammed into every parking space on busy weekends. Then again, there came a gradual shift in how we looked at the park and how we used it. The pressure created by population growth in the Pacific Northwest makes it clear just how unique the park is. For over a century, people have come here to experience this extraordinary place. But now, more and more people know that a key part of experiencing paradise means leaving it the way you found it. Visitors now recognize that for all its power and beauty, paradise is also fragile. Today, hundreds of park volunteers and staff are working to maintain the delicate balance of life. 
The people who created the park left us a gift. How will people use the park in the future? No one knows. But we can choose how to use the park today and how we will leave it for the future. We are Northwest Coast Native Americans. We have a connection to Mount Rainier. If we can relate to our land or our people, what do we have? Now here just to take care of it and pass it on to the next generation. Imagine a park where the next generation will gain as much pleasure and inspiration 